welcome. Hello and welcome to When We Fight, We Win, the podcast. My name is Day Hernandez. And I'm Greg Jobin Leeds, and we, the, we are the authors of the 2016 book, When We Fight, We Win. And when we fight, we win. Day and I and so many others capture some of the stories, philosophy, tactics, and art of today's leading social change movements. So right before we published the book, um, I was working and creating a quilt about prison industrial complex in collaboration with a Puerto Rican quilter from New York City, Silvia Hernandez, that ended up being a cantastoria that accompanied um, the national um, book tour. Then in 2017, we launched a cultural tour uh, where we created a mural about prison abolition in Chicago. Um, and Humboldt, and to celebrate Puerto Rico and uh, political prisoner Oscar Rivera, who was released that year. Uh, but then Hurricane Maria hit the Caribbean, and um, we decided in 2018 to kind of twist a project that we were working on, and we created a participatory and popular education piece. It's a hand illustrated scroll. It's called End uh, the Death, Decolonize, Liberate Puerto Rico, um, which is ab about the colonial history of Puerto Rico in collaboration with a group of artists um, who do similar work from other cities in the US. Um, and then we also followed that with a series of exhibitions featuring artists, both from the When We Fight, We Win uh, book, the publication, and other artists whose work work is about resistance, solidarity, and revolution. About one year ago, we started a project together. When we fight, we win the podcast. And over the last year, we've been able to interview musicians, activists, artists, and people who with their transforming the world do create a better world. And together as a team, when we fight, we win together, um, uh, built this. And the result is a, uh, we this beautiful united artistic community together to create this live show that you're about to that you're now beginning to hear um so in the last month and a half we were fine-tuning the release of this podcast that we thought um it was um, a way of bridging our networks and also extend the conversation past our comrades and our own circles but then in the middle of our last steps to put this out into the world, the um, coronavirus pandemic um, hit, hit, you know, basically all of us. And this has changed so much, our lifestyles, everything. So now we felt compelled to respond to the crisis by producing four life episodes as a rapid response in solidarity. So we're all at adapting in this uncharted territory and we're doing the best as we can. And now with you, we're building this community and we're all in this together and we're all trying to figure out what we can learn about the present situation and how to address it that we face together. Yeah, so here today, um, some of us are based in Boston in Cambridge, Massachusetts, some in Santurce, Puerto Rico, in New South Wales, Australia. And while we're physically distant, we have never been closer as we are bringing you the first of our live shows. Um, this is When We Fight, We Win Life, um, Mutual Aid and Solidarity in Time of Crisis. Um, we hope that you'll join us on Zoom, YouTube, Facebook Live. Um, we'll do this every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern time and over the next month. So we have three coming up. Um, thank you so much for being here, all of you, um, especially um, during our first episode with all the technical um, things that we're dealing with. Um, during this episode, we will be taking questions and would love to hear from you. So at the end of the conversation, we'll open up for, um, for questions. So if you can stay, please do so. Uh, you can send your questions in the Zoom Q&A section. There's a Q&A and our producer Osvaldo will make a selection for us to ask our panelists. Awesome. In today's live episode, we're going to talk with Jorge Diaz, he's the artistic director and of Ajitarte, and he's the We Fight, We Win editor. He's also a friend for more than two decades. And we are also in, joined by Suheli Rodriguez Lebron, who is Ajitarte's lead organizer and program coordinator, Puerto Rico at Casa Terra, 
I've had the honor to spend so many hours at Casa de Air, watch her perform on the book tour and in so many places, share many meals and even paint alongside her and Dave Mural, which was probably my biggest honor. Uh, they had to remove a lot of my paint, but that's okay. And uh, that was in Chicago. And we were also fortunate to be joined by another dear friend, Agustin Munoz Rios. He's the musical director of Papel Machete. So please join me in welcoming me, welcoming Agustin. Your camera is on. Please wave or shake or send smiles or show some love and take it away, Agustin. <laughs> Tini, that was um, part of a song that um, Tini composed, and it's also um, used in a canta storia that Papel Machete uh, family was sharing in Puerto Rico right after Hurricane Maria um, hit the islands. So in 2017, in the space of two weeks, um, Hurricane Irma and Maria hit Puerto Rico, leaving the country destroyed. and are people devastated, whether in the islands or in the diaspora, we were really um, feeling very, um, very hard um, what happened back home. So Jorge, Sugeli, and Agustin were on the ground and in solidarity with our peoples. That we divide our podcast and all our live shows into three parts, which is the pain, the fight, and the wind. And so here comes chapter one. The pain. This first question is for Jorge. Um, Jorge, can you tell us a little bit about what's Agitarte and what's the mission of the organization? Sure, but um, I hope it's not a pain to talk about Agitarte. I hope it's, a, <laughs> <laughs> it's actually something a little bit inspiring for folks. But um, many of you probably uh, know our work already, but basically we're an organization of working class artists who engage in projects of cultural solidarity and mutual aid with communities and, and organizations. Um, we're a movement organization, and um, we typically engage in art projects and uh, with other organizations or communities that want to like amp up, you know, their popular education, their media. Um, we also do trainings, and we build uh, trainings or long-term uh, trainings and relationships with organizations like Southerners on New Ground. And uh, we also develop movement collaborations um, with different organizations and groups. And and um, we're talking about we're going to talk a little bit about our role within that in the movement. And, um, and I think lastly, I, I focus since after the hurricane is, and the reason why we're talking about today is uh, we have a, a focus on mutual solidarity. Um, so, so we create, um, you know, price of mutual solidarity. Um, and, and that's what, you know, what's been a response and the way we've operated uh, since after the hurricane. And I think lastly, I want to mention another project, main of, another one of our main focus or projects is, um, is creating intentional community spaces. Um, like Casa Taller Cangrejera, which uh, Greg uh, mentioned. So Sue, can you talk a little about what Casa is and what is the work here and the need that you fill? Hola, saludos a todas y todes. <laughs> Contenta, I'm happy to, to see you and listen to you all. Casa Taller is our living working space in Santurce. Uh, it's our 
it's our place of it's a place of resistance i believe it's our place of building and strengthening our uh, community uh, it's a place where we have our artists living there and also artists that do residency with us so it's mostly uh, the place where we do cultural work and community solidarity um, and we aim through that to be able to transform our living conditions in, in the island. So que, that's for that's Casa Taller and the work I do there is mostly organizing. I do a lot of uh, development of programs and workshops for the community and also from uh, outside the, the Casa Taller. So we, we also do like a lot of coordinating with other groups and in other parts of, of the island. And I'm also a performer for, uh, of Papel Machete. So that's part of what uh, we do in the, in the house is the workshop for our theater group, Papel Machete. And well, we, we mostly spend time together there, like trying to elaborate and, creative, and create spaces for other artists and, um, and the community we to, to to work in solidarity. Jorge, um, can you share with um, with our audience the conditions or the context um, in Puerto Rico that um, shifted the work of Agitarte to be doing um, mutual aid in, like to focus really the work that we were doing in mutual aid in times of crisis? Right, right. Um, um, <laughs> well, um, I think it's best to tell the story. Like I got there, I got, um, we, we were in the tour, um, in the arts and culture tour when we fight, we win. And, um, I had a small break in Puerto Rico uh, to do a training uh, that we were organizing uh, with Rocka Society and uh, Jornada Se Acabaron Las Promesas. And um, so I got Puerto Rico on a Friday and we had that workshop Saturday and Sunday. And I remember on Sunday, uh, we actually had the conversation, you know, the hurricane's coming, it's huge, it's gonna impact us, what are we gonna do? And uh, right uh, at that time we were at uh, La Federación de Maestros de Puerto Rico at that space. And um, people said, you know, we can meet here and, and, I, and I was like, oh, we can meet at Casa Taller Cangrejera. And um, the hurricane came. We spent, you know, a couple of days um, just getting the house together. We had uh, like four families stay in the house um, because they didn't have a safe place to stay. And then, you know, it hit us. And um, I think after it hit us, we had, a, we, had a, we had a shock, a little bit like where we're at now, like a, still in shock of what's happening. And, and um, I think it was about a week in, maybe a week and a half in, you know, like, of really having a tough time just figuring out even how to how to eat you know we had to pool all our resources together um to even eat um i had no food if it wasn't for my community i would have not had any food because um i just got him back so um so it was then coming together then we i think i can't remember but i know one day we just kind of snapped out of it and was like you know we we have to do something you know where you know the the we have the space and people just started arriving to our space and it became a communications hub at first. You know, we have multiple meetings from different people all over the island that would come to there. And also we became a distribution place for many of the projects that I'm, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more. But uh, because we were in the middle of the city and because we had deep relationships with folks, uh, our work shifted. And um, at the same time, because we had people in the U.S. and again, deep relationships with our Southern King, with folks like Southern is a New Ground, with the Movement for Black Lives, uh, with Mi Gente with other folks that we've been building for years, you know, people start stepping up and asking us what you need. So it was, it was just, um, it made sense that we had to pivot and that if we talk about cultural solidarity, we talk about, you know, all the work that, you know, produces culture and all the work that we do produces culture. So our way in is media, our way in is arts, but really thinking, you know, what does cultural solidarity mean and how can we have transformations in our movement um, from the cultural work, but really, um, stepping up and pivoting when in, that organizing is necessary and the need is there for our survival. Thank you, Jorge. We're going to shift um, to speak about the mutual aid um, work in Puerto Rico. Um, so we're going to call that our chapter two, The Fight. So, Sue, could you share with us what were the mutual aid programs that developed, um, that Ahi Tarte organized and delivered after Hurricane Irma and then Hurricane Maria? See, um, right after the, the hurricanes, um, Casa Taller became like a meeting spot for not only for us, but for uh, other organizations and community. And from there, we started to organize. Uh, 
Casa Taller became a mutual support center, like many others that were emerging because of the need of survival by, by that time. Este, and um, part of the work we did was uh, to, to create like a center of communications because back then there were a lot of incommunication. People have to drive through the highway only to reach a little bit of signal to be able to, to connect or listen to what was going on in the country. Nobody knew exactly the first weeks or month uh, what was going on. It, uh, we didn't know about our families. Uh, so uh, we were lucky that one of our members uh, of our community, Agustin, had like a signal and everybody came to the Casa Taller just to reach out for a little bit of moment of being able to talk to their loved ones during that uh, time. Uh, and also, already in Casa Taller, we had uh, a collective kitchen. It didn't work every, every, every time. We only like activate the collective kitchen when we have like projects that involve people uh, that come to Casa Taller to do an artist residency or to work in a specific project. But this time around, uh, it was so needed to have this space. Uh, not everyone had like uh, a space to, to really like feed and they didn't have the resources to get food. So at the beginning, when in, when after Irma, it was very like organic. Everybody brought what they had at, the, at their homes and everybody started cooking. We made a calendar. Each day, a different person with, will do the, the work of cooking. A different person uh, will do collectively also the work of cleaning. So we, we did organize in, in Casa Taller that way. And after Maria, it was more intentional. It, uh, more people started to come. And we, we served three meals a day it, uh, for months uh, for our community. And also, we developed an, an outreach uh, project. Uh, in our community, mostly in El Barrio Machuchal in Santurce, uh, when Rocio and Cus and Katia and friends went door by door, just seeing what their needs were. Mm -hmm. And we started to um, cook with a crew of people that came to Casa Taller every morning to cook and make lunches and bring them and go, we, we went home by home bring them to the elders and bring them the food to people that couldn't get out of their houses or mothers and, you know, with child that were alone. And also we did a rehabilitation of the garden. We it, uh, anticipated the hurricane coming. Obviously everybody anticipated that, but we didn't know how hard it would be until the moment. So uh, we tried to save most weekend in our, uh, dining room, all the plants that we could, and seeds and everything. And then after the hurricane, rosemary, pluma barbara, maltamel, a bunch of, of our friends and members of our community started to rehabilitate the, the garden so we can be able to have fresh foods. Uh, we also organized Papel Machete members to, to have a creative process to, to build this cantastoria. It's a, like a picture storytelling uh, uh, piece that we, uh, Estefania uh, designed and we all participated in it. And Tini and Isamar did all the text and music and we went through all the island telling the story of what was going on in the country and how the government abandoned our peoples during those hard times and how the existing crisis that we were facing were like, exploding more and more in our faces in, in, in such moment. So, uh, so we did the Canta Storia and we brought uh, not only food and, and first aid to these communities and mutual support centers, we also brought theater and performances and art workshops. Uh, other thing we did was um, to, to um, organize with other members of our artistic community uh, and coordinated with them so they can go to the different mutual support centers around the island and bring workshops, different kind of workshops, uh, uh, healing workshops, 
health workshops. Uh, we did art, we did um, bomba, we, well, anything you can imagine, we try, really try to fulfill those needs in that moment. Um, and Ajitarte also provided like uh, resources for these artists and organizers to move around. At, uh, so in some way, our community was sustained at, uh, by each other. And also it was, we, we, we did it because we had been receiving all this love and aid from our peoples in the diaspora. We did like a visual art also a, a project in which we developed this map uh, that uh, Emily Simmons, I think, was the one that do the design it and then Primo worked hard on it. Like just to point out where are, where were those mutual sports centers in the map? And we wanted to decentralize also like the aid so people can really go right through right to the the these different mutual support centers and gave, gave their donations directly to them so they can move forward in the organizing and it, uh, and doing these grassroots works in our communities around the island we did a lot of things i'm so <laughs> exhausted only just telling it uh, but yeah i think i'm tired only talking about it <laughs> Uh, yeah, so now we, we also started using our space to just gather all, all this aid and we started to distribute it. Uh, so we also, the Casa Taller became like a un centro de acopio. Yo no sé cómo se dice en inglés, pero... Distribution center. Uh, Distribution yeah. See, sí. and we took a lot of orders, orders uh, for food from all different mutual support centers that were organizing collective kitchens. And with Jorge and, and yeah, we, they did like the, the shopping of these groceries and then we distributed it them to, to the places that were needed. And yeah, I think, yeah, one of the most important things was like we giving support, support to each other, but also giving support to other organizers and activists and artists to fulfill our work in that moment. We still are, <laughs> we still are till today. So. Yeah, we, you guys were a role model for us. And I, was, I want to mention something. Why we, why we wanted you on as our first guest because you've, you've gone through and built what, what we're all needing to build right here, right now. I want to mention something um, and um, thank you so Haley because I, I know it's hard to talk about all the things that we did and you know and um the moment called for it you know and uh but i want i want to just to mention and recognize uh giovanni roberto and the work of comedores sociales because it was when giovanni roberto came over to our space and and he was basically like there's hundreds of people and lines of food and they need they need you all there doing theater doing popular education talking about what's happening because people in puerto rico didn't have the information that even people in, outside puerto rico had because of the lack of access to communication so i want to recognize not only that it was the folks in comedores sociales that started the Centro de Apoyo Mutuo um, in Caguas a couple of days after the hurricane, but also uh, coming over and basically, you know, inviting us, almost making a request for the kind of work that then led to the Cantastoria that Suheili spoke about that got taken around the island to many different communities. And again, my island, I mean, uh, main island, because Puerto Rico is actually a set of islands. So let me correct myself, Ar archipelago. So I just wanted to add that and, and recognize the work of compañeras, compañeres that are, you know, been doing this in frontline work for many time. And, and, and the reason, again, that we can even do this is because of those deep relationships that we, we've been working with folks for years. And um, all of our work is, um, um, is part of that, part of that uh, great network and that we are a movement organization. Right. Um, even if briefly, uh, Jorge, you're speaking about um, uh, organizations in the islands, but also if you can share with the audience how how we were able to move the work forward. Um, and I'm definitely thinking about the diaspora as well and networks in, in the US. If you I can mean, speak to that even briefly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting because you did a lot of this work. So I know you're interviewing me, but like I know it's a process that we're lucky to have a staff that's transnational, you know, that, that can be in different places. 
and, and it's because of the diaspora, it's because of the material conditions that we have this transnational staff. Um, um, so, so of, of course, it, it was very important having those relationships and the fact that our, you know, that our development um, coordinator, uh, Tina Orlandini, you know, had a campaign set up and the work that, that, that they, you and Tina did to like really work those networks because our communication, as you said, was very limited. We had to buy these pay, phone, uh, you know, pay as you go phones uh, from Claro, which was the only company that was working. And, you know, it was really difficult to communicate. So the, the relationships, I mean, the relationship to the work and it's just no way around it. When we talk about solidarity, we're talking about, you know, um, being there for each other. And this idea of mutual aid um, or, or mutual solidarity is something that changed our whole outlook and the way we work and that, that, that our principles are based on these relationships of mutual support and that we need to do that and that that's the only way to be able to build this work. So, so thank you for asking, but I think that, you know, that really is a question that, you know, you know, that I can, you know, that, that, that really makes me think about, you know, how we continue to build, you know, how as a global South, as transnational communities, as nationalities, be, I mean, I'm sorry, communities beyond national borders, uh, how we continue to build as, as the material conditions of the world shift. And as we're going to see a lot of different catastrophes and situations where coming together, where those relationships that we've been building for years will come to fruit and, um, and that we can trust each other so we can get through this together and continue in this journey for liberation. What were the ways that you all dealt with the stress and anxiety and the trauma and how did you help your community um, on that level? See, I think um, just to be able to be together was one of the first things that we have at hand just to deal with what was going on and what's still going on. Like uh, acknowledging that we are accountable to each other and that we can in some ways support each other it, for me it was part of that dealing with stress and anxiety like personally so uh, along we I, I i couldn't done anything that we've been doing so uh, eh, para mí es parte de un proceso de, de cómo nos comprendemos en comunidad como how we understand each other in community este, so, aparte de eso, having friends and knowing that in our community we have people that do a lot of solidarity, healing work, like acupuntura para el pueblo, like our friend eh, Lucho, Lourdes. There was a bunch of people around here that were doing an amount, amazing amount of work into our centros de apoyo mutuo and communities. Also, I remember something very special to me was when healers from Boston came, este, our compañera, they organized with another healers and came, and they went to different uh, centros de apoyo mutuo, including Casa Taller, and I didn't knew how much I was really needing, like, like a moment just to stop and breathe, and, and yeah, to save it. I think that helped us like continue. So I think we all together, in a way, help each other to, to move on and to work with those trauma and distress and anxiety. This very moment right now with the coronavirus is very like challenging uh, because not everybody is with people around at home. Many, many people still in Puerto Rico living in, in casetas in the south. The south keeps, keeps trembling with the earthquake still going on. So there is a lot happening, este, and sometimes I I feel I I'm trying to think how how can we in this very moment be of a, of support to to a lot of other people that we know are passing through very hard times right now, and not everyone not everyone has a, the privilege to connect connect through internet or social media. So it's a concern that I have, really have. And I still like thinking every night and day, how can we, how can we continue to support our people and community in this specific time with this, este, con esta, con estas características que son tan distintas, so different of what we, we've been through before. 
Yeah, I think um, part of it, um, I have this next question, um, how is this work ongoing? But I feel like we were having this discussion too, like we're figuring, we're figuring out as, as other people are figuring out. But I wonder if you've had a little bit of time of, of thinking and could be Sue, Jorge, or share the mic, like how's this work ongoing or moving forward? I mean, the last couple, right, the last week and a half, two weeks has been just, you know, canceling and, you know, and just um, trying to make sure that everybody is okay. And at the same time, we have a lot of ongoing projects. And for example, I mean, we have this um, project that, um, that we've been working for a while and then um, it's called On the Eve of Abolition, which is um, a radical imaginary future play about the last day of the last prison of, this, of these freed transnational territories and parts of the U.S., or what is known as the U.S. today. And, um, and for example, that project becomes very important, like with everything that's happening right now with, you know, with, with the prisons, you know, with places like Rikers, uh, we don't even know the situation right now, the prisons in Puerto Rico, you know, and um, so, 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 so even, even the content of our work and talking about the moment and thinking of the moment that we're at now will affect definitely how we do the work moving forward. And that includes the creative work that includes, as we can discuss, what our mutual aid response will be. And that will really affect, you know, it, it, everything, even our trainings. We have training plan in a month um, with Southerners on your ground folks in Puerto Rico and intensive. It's going to affect all the work that we do. So we are in the process right now um, since it's a very different um, situation. And also to contrast that in Puerto Rico, people have to be in their houses and not get arrested. It's not, except for tourists, I want to add at that because there's a lot of American tourists just walking around while Puerto Ricans are getting arrested for being outside, even walking their dogs. It's a very different situation in the U.S., right? The U.S. is, um, you know, People out here will believe in the personal freedom over, you know, over the collective, and it's having a toll, and it's going to take a toll. So there's, there's a lot of, to learn still from the lessons that we learned of mutual aid and solidarity from the times that we've lived, but also we're in a moment that we know we're going to have to pivot uh, again and, 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 and to rethink um, a lot of the, you know, paradigms and paradigm, you know, on the way we've, we have been operating in. Um, and also because we know that this can bring uh, many different, you know, conditions, you know, as, as the control of our bodies, as this is used to capitalize again with disaster capitalism, taking every opportunity to generate new markets for exploitation. So we're also like, you know, looking at, you know, like what can be a response and, and we will be, we will be engaged in a response and it'll be artistic. Uh, it'll be mutual solidarity. Um, and, and it'll be in our program um, as we figure out how to, how to continue to work, to, to, to work as a staff and, and, um, and, and really, and really move to where we're most needed. Um, at the same time that we take care of each other. Chapter three, the win. So what, Sue, maybe if you can share what are some of the most important lessons that we can apply here now or um, what really worked uh, during the mutual aid and uh, with the uh, Centros de Apoyo Mutual, um, can you talk about, and also can you talk about maybe the scroll and some of the beauty that emerged in the process uh, of, the, um, of the mutual aid? Sí, yo creo que one of the most important lessons for me was to be este, in communication with our all the different uh, organizers and people doing like grassroots in their communities and listening to the needs. Uh, also, how we were always like thinking on how to, eh, ¿cómo se dice? Eh, trasladar el trabajo, like not to be able to, the work that we were doing not become service, service like, like the government does and stuff like right. that. Other institutions to just become a service organization. Yeah. Yeah. Este, how we can really uh, be of mutual support through solidarity work, and the people can be empowered and be transformed by it. Como, uh, so one for me, one of the lessons was like really reflect in some moment like what we were doing and how we didn't want it to stay in a level of only like giving, 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 and not like putting other, our communities really into, into the work. Este, and we, we, we shifted, I think, we, I believe we, we started to shift that 
through all those through all these years because the work ha hasn't stopped there. A lot of uh, Centro de Apoyo Mutuo is still going on. We have a lot of our friends and comrades doing radical, great work in, in these different communities. Este, so I believe in some way, even though we are not maybe like uh, in a communication constantly like we was at the, at the beginning with Maria, we still know of the work of what people is doing. And so to keep on, to keep on moving and to keep on like pushing uh, that, that world, uh, that Puerto Rico that we really want to live in is for me one of the most important lessons uh, throughout the experience. And for the scroll, it, uh, which is a beautiful storytelling piece it, uh, that tells the story of struggle and resistance of our peoples it, uh, uh, and the colonialism and, and the suffering of our people because of colonialism. Uh, and we've been, been able to like show it to communities, Centro de Apoyo Mutuo, schools, it has been very empowering. It, it has been like giving to our people the story in their hands and to imagine themselves living a life of dignity, living a different life in, in the country on, we, we, we imagine. So. So beautiful, gracias. Jorge, um, what, um, what were the biggest challenges um, in delivering the mutual aid? Well, I, th I think, um, I think before um, we talk about delivery, right? Um, I think um, in Suheli can talk better about delivery um, in terms of like, how we got to the communities, and I, I can certainly speak to it. But I think, just taking a step back, I think it was more about how to how to navigate even getting the resources. Um, we had um, when when this all started again, we were lucky that 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 Tina foresaw a starting a campaign and, and um, out of our frontline organizations, we were able to raise probably the most money. You know, we're not a big nonprofit. Um, we've been growing steadily little by little. Uh, but for, for, for our groups, we are in a few organizations that had the capacity to even receive the funds. So we're lucky to have put that forward and, and we raised more money than we thought. And, and, um, and, and, and that money that we raised, we, we were able to fund a lot of people and just put money in people's hands. Um, uh, so they could continue the work that we're doing. Um, so, but, but really t trust was really hard. Um, so a lot of people that had the resources, uh, for example, the food that we got and all that stuff, a lot of people didn't have deep trust in us. They didn't think that we could do this, you know, like this lack of trust of artists <clears throat> a lot of times, you know, right, um, as organizers. And there's also a lack of trust because of political reasons. So, so we had a di really difficult time. I had a difficult time managing these big NGOs in the U.S. that wanted to provide help to Puerto Rico, but in the middle of us providing food for you know over 15 communities, they wanted us to have a report of how many plates we have served, you know, which was completely unrealistic at the time. Funny enough, later on we did have some metrics as good as we could get them because people had lists. But in the middle of the crisis, and they stopped sending food literally, you know. We had a person policing us and what, what food we were even ordering when I went there with community folks. So, and it wasn't even the company, funny enough. It wasn't the private, terrible anti-union company that we got the food from because that's where they had the contract. It was actually the NGO and the person on the ground and the people in the U.S. So a lot of times that we had to face this idea of NGOs telling us what to do, the big NGOs raising, and I say NGOs, non-governmental organizations, right? In the U.S., people say nonprofits. So big nonprofits that were gobbling up the funds and deciding who gets the money. Uh, still, lucky enough, we had the relationships and we had people that we were able still to raise, you know, money that, you know, that got us through a couple months, you know, of food, of, of, of funding folks, of the work that we're doing on the front lines at the time, and, and to be able to also, you know, um, pay our artists to do the rapid response art, um, you know, that we were generating at the time. So, the, really, again, this idea of trusting, of, you know, we, we put PayPal's down on a map and we told people you have to give directly to folks because if we don't give directly to folks, you know, it will never get to the communities. You know, we had, we had some problems also with this disaster tourism, you know, and this disaster savior mentality of a lot of folks coming, you know, um, and that doesn't mean that people weren't useful. You know, some people were certain skills and they have a sensibility and they've been working with us in the movement. And that's what I mean by deep relationships, but other folks stepping up, you know, that thought they were doing the right thing, but, 
really having a lot of this colonial imperialistic attitudes, which are unfortunate that happen in these moments. But it was a constant, constantly happening from all kinds of people and all and everything from media to mutual aid work, et cetera. It was very difficult to navigate it. But in the end, people stepped up and we knew also who was the people who was down. You know, it was a moment of really testing who is really down, what are the relationships that we're gonna we're gonna that we're gonna build now that we have a mutual aid lens, you know, and that we're gonna we're in this, but we're in this together. So it, it, that experience almost like you know um, it grounded us to understand that we have to be careful how we move in this, and that folks you know need to take the lead from the people on the ground. And um, a lot of times the ideas that you have or what needs to be done is not what it is. And um, having that openness and, and really struggling with our paradigms of how does the U.S. and people in the U.S. don't have a colonial imperialistic attitude when they do work outside or even in communities in the U.S. I think it's a, it's, 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 it's a shift that can happen and we saw it happen with the people that were committed. So, so I have to say as bad as and difficult as it was, it also made our relationship stronger and we're in a place now where we can talk about the kind of relationships we can build to mutual solidarity and the kind of work that happens because we build those relationships. Right now, uh, we've actually only gained more and more participants as these shows going on. We're up to 54 people, and then there's more on Facebook Live. So we're going to continue for about another 20 minutes. Uh, there'll be more music, and uh, and we'll be doing uh, more of the uh, interview and delving more into the win that was part of it. Uh, so I wanted to ask Sue, what what were some of the biggest mistakes made by those? Uh, I mean, Jorge dived into the uh, uh, the colonial attitude of uh, many of us in the uh, diaspora or many of us in want to help. Um, are there other mistakes that you wanted to share? And um, yeah. Well, mistakes, I don't, that word. <laughs> I feel like most of the people that really uh, approach to us because they knew suddenly about the work we were doing or they sympathize uh, with the work. We're really, for me, maybe trying to, to, to help to Sabe. I, I don't know if, we, if, if it is a mistake. I, I, I feel more like sometimes people don't realize the amount of, of work and maybe energy that a lot of us have to put into into things just to make them possible and that thing of asking for spaces just to hear them out and not really like trying to bring something that can be useful for all for everybody it uh, was kind of a, a challenge it, uh, because we we really didn't have in that moment and now maybe the time to attend all everybody that wants to come in and 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 to say i want to help i want to help how can i do this how can I do that i still right now having the emails from a lot of people and i believe is it, it, it really comes from a good place of we want to be the part of the, the mutual support and we want to support you we just need to talk more about it and how can that uh, be uh, transformed into something that can really make make us like make something broader and not like put more like heaviness into uh, what we are actually doing it uh, so for me it's not a mistake it's just something that we need to keep on talking and keep on listening to, to each other. And I think other other thing that for me was kind of hard was knowing in the process that other people and organization were using like our names like Papel Machete or Agitarte este, to do stuff uh, like uh, uh, fundraisers and stuff and we didn't knew about that happening we knew about that uh, later on and we never heard of that donation or stuff coming back to us so it was kind of funky some some things that happened uh, so we we try to be more careful and really como que a la gente que de verdad de corazón quieren tu sabes meter mano y apoyar que 
no, be genuine about it and to sabe, no, eso. I think that was something that for me was kind of hard to deal with. Thank you, Sue. Uh, Jorge, um, how did that work that was initiated um, after Hurricane Maria uh, came to shape or change the, our mission and our role within the communities that we're part of and, and defining our work in the future? And, and maybe this time you want to give like concrete examples of some of the stuff we've been doing? After the hurricane, you know, uh, Suheli talked about a lot about the work and uh, um, we continued um, sp specifically in the, in, in the program work and how we decided to move forward. Um, we always were very, very, very generous and very political, open and politically generous in a space and how we use our space and who we lend it to. So after, after, after the hurricane, we started like rethinking, okay, what kind of relationships do we want to build and who are the organizations and prizes that we can build and at what different levels, you know? So in that already, as we deal with other projects, is like the idea of mutual solidarity has to be there. And, and so Haley mentioned this, the amount of work that goes just to try to answer the amount of emails. I mean, we have a very small staff for the amount of work that we do, like most organizations. I know we're not special in that sense, but just to highlight that for a second. Um, so even dealing with all that as, as was a challenge. So, so we had to think, okay, who do we answer? Who do we accept? Who do we give interviews to? Because we had many interviews that never came back interviews that were edited, edited out the context by people who we thought were close to us and that were parallel with us politically and um, stuff got used against us. You know, people made, you know, all, all these different projects, like Suheli said, that weren't genuine, at least in terms of that relationship. It might've been genuine for the person, right? This is my, my, you know, my dissertation and I need to use this group to be able to do it. But you know, this is a conversation that doesn't happen enough. How community organizations, how organizations at, at, at the front line you know, get approached by a lot of people and, you know, and, and there's a lot of drain and extraction. So we really been thoughtful about not being in an extraction model and being really in a solidarity model. And even though something that we did, I think the hurricane reinforced that. And I think it had an effect then when we now had a response to the earthquake uh, in, in January, where we were able to respond quickly. And also it didn't necessarily mean that it was just agitarte. We were like facilitating a process for other artists, other groups, other people who do this work also to go there. So, so that basis of like the program that we do is not just about us. We're a movement organization. We've been building these organizations and we know they can do the work. How can we get resources to them? How can we help people develop? So we have 15, 20, 25 projects like this in our islands and another 50 in the U.S. So really thinking more strategically about how we're going to use our time and work and how do we want to build out um, the organization. And also structural and internal changes that I think that we've been considering and talking about, which, you know, soon we'll have some shifts in the organization to reflect the processes that we've been having. So um, we've been also, you know, trying to, to, to play a role in the movement, again, of technical support of like, okay, we have to be a nonprofit, um, you know, even though we're looking at other possibilities of, you know, solidarity economy models, but we have to be a nonprofit for now. How can we help others that already went into this do it? And how can we do it from an ethical place? How can we not fall into the trap, the typical game of nonprofits? So how can we continue to be a movement organization, you know, with radical ethics, and still be operating into this world contradiction, world of contradictions of nonprofits, um, but understanding that we need to generate a project that can sustain our artists and that can help build a movement. So we also learned that, like we have each other, we got each other's backs, we need to take care of each other, and and understanding that deep um, commitment to our relationships and to ourselves um, as a community, as a family, uh, definitely got strengthened after uh, the experiences we had after the hurricane. Thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm realizing the way Dan and I are uh, taking turns asking questions, and but we're also taking turns asking Jorge and Sue questions. So it's ending up, I'm asking Sue every question and Dave's asking Jorge every question. But anyway, we'll go, we'll go with our flow and we're gonna have to mix it up for our next show. So um, Sue, um, so you've been dealing with mutual aid in the wake of multiple disasters, right? one after the other, you know, right, you had right, two hurricanes, the fiscal crisis, the earthquakes, and now the coronavirus. And, you know, it's just like, just doesn't stop. And but you, since you've been on the ground, uh, garnering all this experience in such different situations, 
so in a form of solidarity to people in New York and Spain who uh, in Italy who you know who are who are right now at the epicenter of this crisis is there some solidarity you can share with those communities around the world so to feel supported as we face the coronavirus and the uh, the impact of this uh, pandemic well I want to know how really I want to know how to be supportive I want to have the answer to that but I think I believe right now we are also struggling to say how to how to survive this it, uh, I believe conditions are very different where we are we are even we're not even able to to be in contact right now with each other only through this technology thing that not every everyone and one of them knows how to navigate it and, and how to work with it so I'm, I'm really struggling with this zoom thing and stuff este, but I think in times like this we need to keep on communicating we need to keep on talking to each other we need to keep on like thinking of ways in which we can surpass como podemos sobrepasar este momento and at the end be able to to say we we win this we we can really este, be together and transform in other ways to save i don't like the word resilient or resilient i don't like that word i don't like that we need to always be like to save trying to be um, como tratando de moldearnos el momento or we need to have a big like all everything that is outside is, is is telling us how to behave and how to survive i think right now we need to find ways in which we can take control of whatever situation take control of of everything and and really stand still and resist what what is being going right now what what are we going through I think right now the word that comes to mind is continue resisting and continue communicating, communicating how we feel. And if we need anything, also reach out to reach out to your family and friends. Because what we got is, is I think at the end is each other. We're overwhelmed and anxious, anxious, even even where some of us get to be in in you know in a safe space of home, assuming that we're in a safe space, right? Um, not, not saying that everybody is, but um, how can we um, organize or mobilize people that are staying in, that perhaps are home and have, might have a little bit of time? That's a conversation we just started having um, again. So it's, um, I wish I had answers. I mean, I think there's a lot of good efforts right now. I don't know if anybody is next to the chat. I can't can't reach my computer, but <laughs> I'm sure that we have some resources for folks. You know, I know it's a lot of efforts and they're mostly relying right now on these, on these technology. And I already hear people complaining about the technology, which is I think a little odd because most people don't even have this access, but, um, but uh, I know this is a, I think we have to take a stage by stage. So I think at this point we've been talking about different possibilities of, of doing things outside, you know, that don't have to have physical contact with folks, you know, that there's possibilities for popular education. Um, that there's possibility for even doing some mutual support, like some places are doing all over this country, the U.S., I mean, because that's where I'm stuck right now, uh, in the U.S., which, um, again, I'm, I don't know if we can share those resources via chat, but definitely there's a lot of projects happening right now in, in different communities, and, and, and people have been are talking about this. Um, but um, our, our, our programming, a lot, of it, uh, a lot of it that is related to directly working with communities is based out of Puerto Rico because of our resources. And in the U.S., it's more like the design work and workshops, et cetera. So in Puerto Rico right now, there's not a situation where, we're, where that mutually can happen because people are really locked in their houses. So what we have is these mediums and we're having the conversations. You know, we're trying to use technology to our advantage. At this point, even we know it's controlled and we know, you know it, 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 it can get in the way. At this point, it's actually useful. We're using social media and we're taking the time to develop those projects that we've you know, been wanting to. Like we've been developing an emerging uh, media project. I don't know if you've seen some of it. It's been a very low budget, but we just kind of rolled it out of the earthquake with a wonderful friend, Juan Carlos Davila, who's an artist in residency and uh, other 
of our cohorts, Katia and, um, and Juan and other folks that are working on this project, Osvaldo. And, and, and again, um, we're saying, okay, how can we take this moment to then continue the work that we do and, 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 and shift, even if it's for now, not forgetting that we are going to come back together, that we're going to take it back to the streets, that this is going to happen, that we're not going to let this situation turn into a policing of our bodies and for the state to decide how we're going to be as a people and how we're going to congregate. And it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be inside now. I'm not talking about that. I believe in the flattening of the curve. I believe that in the U.S. should be more strict in some, in some ways. But of course, strict for whom, right? It, does, it can't be by targeting our homeless people, our most affected communities, you know, the, the, the subalternas. It, it can't be in the backs of us like it always is, like this country is ready to do again, you know, and ready to do it again with all the resources in the world and not being able to deal with the situation for our peoples. So we know that mutual aid and solidarity is something that we're going to continue to build. But we are right now in the process of just trying to figure out where are we? How do we even manage all these conversations? How do we do it? But if, if, if you're down with us, stay tuned, you know, check our social media, add yourself, ahitarte.org, you know, add yourself to the list, um, well, you know, and, um, and we'll be in touch and, and, and don't hesitate to build and, you know, to, and to communicate with us, you know, and, and, and to continue building. And uh, we're, we're definitely going to do that because we understood after the hurricane that we had to do this to survive and that we had to survive. We have to be a community. And that's something that guides our work. And that's something that we'll continue to do to the day, you know, that we can't do this any longer. And I know it's a personal commitment, but it's also a collective commitment that we made and that we hold it, you know, in a, in, in a way that, you know, defines our path and journeys. And it's, again, part of our survival. And that's why we continue to do this work. And that's why the frame of mutual aid and solidarity is so important to us in our, in our project for liberation. Thinking about all the incredible art and beauty that came out of the hurricane and your comment about, you know, us defining it. I'm just grab one of your, one of Ajitarte's poster I'm holding up. No, I'll, <clears throat> no, I'll go gobierno militar. And, uh, uh, you know, the that whole statement of uh, uh, the incredible art that you guys were able to produce at that moment of crisis. I think what we wanted to do now is uh, turn to some questions that the audience has been uh, posing. And so um, the, uh, and um, and then we're going to take a break, have some more music, and um, uh, and and finish up with some more questions at the end there. So uh, while I'll jump in with the first question, here's one from uh, um, Dave Ragland, a dear friend uh, who I met uh, through work in Ferguson. He writes, "Is there a larger uh, movement to connect, create, network, uh, internal communities that's going on right now?" Um, we're like, he writes, we are likely at the beginning of a new era of disconnection and increased effort by the U.S. government to take more rights and social safety net. So, um, yeah, I don't know if either of you want to uh, answer that question. And then um, I'll look, Gasvaldo, uh, uh, to feed us our next questions after that for Day and I through the Slack channel. I mean, I think it's a, it's a question that we have to answer together. And I think we have to build more spaces to, to have those conversations. And of course, I mean, I don't, you know, um, understanding too that those conversations will happen in the spaces that you already have relationships as well, even though it's an opportunity to build other networks. So I'm sure Dave has, you know, networks back, you know, back home and trying to figure out how to make that happen at that level. But it's, I think it's a conversation that we should continue to have. And, um, and again, I hope when we fight you win can, you know, can be a platform to promoting all these efforts because a lot of local efforts are happening right now. And, um, and, you know, and, and yes, and um, we need better ways to network, make sure that, that, that anybody knows about these. Um, so I, I don't know other than that, how to answer. I think we've had, we already talked about this and it's, a, it's an ongoing thing. I think it's early on and we have to think of, this is a long game. So we should have, start having those conversations. So as this evolves and unfolds, we have a frame to think from and be like, okay, that's what we're talking about. Okay, this is how we can ship. All right, this is how we're gonna work now. Yeah, and so Dave and everybody else, if you have resources to share, we'll be sharing it on our social media. So keep feeding it to us, and uh, and we'll be getting it out there as we've been doing. Okay, I get to read Juan Carlos Davila question. Um, how do you practice mutual aid when people need to be in quarantine and cannot get physically together due to the pandemia, right? I think... 
como as, as Jorge says, we are still having conversations around that. Este, I, I believe right now what we are doing is trying to communicate with our, with our communities. I've been reaching out a lot of people este, from Papel Machete or collab collaborators or extended family, people in the South, people in other camps. We are just like reaching out everybody, seeing how they are, what are the needs right now. And uh, truly trying to, together with the staff, develop what are going to be our next steps to, to, to make like a mutual support in these conditions right now. Uh, for the moment, we are thinking of making, uh, uh, we, Tini and I are talking about making a cantastoria, este, because we, we think right now it's very important to talk about ending the illegal debt that is imposed to Puerto Rico right now and using those mo this money that they have, uh, the Fiscal Control bo Board has to really give people roof right now. A lot of people are living in the streets. We have people exposed, really exposed to, to this virus right now. So we need to, to start again, really talking really, really uh, uh, hard about what is the, the debt and we need to cancel it. So we, we are trying to, to make a um, performance. We will do it through the uh, social media because it's the resource we have right now at hand until we start to think how we are going to do more stuff outside and going like directly making mutual support to the people in their houses. But we as a staff has been talking este, and dealing. We also talk about eh, Davila, you made the question, making like media videos este, that we can share and still go on with that project of media that we have already. And we started with the uh, terremotos and, uh, and so on. So yes, we have a lot of thoughts about it, but right now they are limited to what we can do through uh, phones and computers and internet. There are some resources uh, some people are putting in the chat site. One mention was about an excellent model happening in Somerville, Mass, right next door to where I am. And I know here in Cambridge, there's, uh, we got a note at our door uh, saying, if you need help or you wanna help out delivering food and mutual aid, the whole concept of mutual aid is really spreading. Um, so um, I'm gonna jump to a last question and then I think we're gonna turn it to the music. Uh, and then we're gonna wrap up and uh, after the music, we'll have, we'll have a little close out for everybody. But the, um, this last question was about where um, artists can go for emergency grants right now. Um, is Ajitarte making emergency grants to artists and cultural workers? And if anybody knows any resources, uh, I don't know if anybody uh, on our panelists knows, but uh, certainly uh, if there are resources, uh, we'll, we'll make them known. I know uh, I know the local, some of the local communications are doing it um, here in Cambridge and, and other places as well. But uh, Jorge, do you know about uh, emergency grants to artists and cultural workers? Well, um, we don't have any resources to do any, but we're more than happy um, to receive any funds and to regrant, which is what we've done in the past. Um, we did it uh, after the hurricane. Um, because we raised a lot more money than we thought. So we, we gave away about $60,000 then, and we gave up another $60,000 and just make it really accessible for folks based on relationships and the work that folks are doing. So we're more than happy to manage that capital, you know, as an organization that's still, you know, just still fundraising, you know, for its own, you know, just to survive. It's also a challenge. So we're not making a request, but I'm more than happy to receive those kind of funds from folks. You know, as, as you know, when you do fundraising, you always challenge when so many things happen after each other, when do you ask for money? When do you don't, you know, and um, it's always a challenge. And now that everybody needs money, I mean, we know that we, you know, trying to take a step back and figure out how to position ourselves, but we're more than happy uh, to talk about this. We're very transparent on how we spend our money and how we do the giving. So more than happy with anybody that, you know, that has that kind of resources to have that conversation. But I'm all, I, I've seen stuff on the internet, but I haven't seen anything official right now that I can, that, that I can vouch for. So I, I'm very careful because a lot of these things come up after these situations and I'm very careful what I promote and what I talk about, but um, I'm sure there's um, 
there's ways to find out out there and, and do the research. I'm sorry that I don't have specific answers for this right now, but I would just be careful and, and who, to, who to give money to and, and, uh, and, um, and hopefully folks can get supported through this process. Yeah, so I'll, I'll make a pitch then for uh, Heat Dark Day. You know, if you want to support artists, uh, uh, go to their website. You can donate there and um, they will get money out to artists as they have always done. So now we're going to slip to uh, 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 with Agustin's uh, music. He's going to share some more of his incredible music and then they will wrap us up. En el horizonte una isla se ve Indio y negro trabajando valiente En el horizonte una isla se ve Indio y negro trabajando valiente Cultivando caña, sembrando café Tierra que pelea Sembrando café, tierra que pelearon para defender. En esta colonia, ya hicieron nación, lucha y resistencia por algo mejor. En esta colonia se hicieron nación, lucha y resistencia por algo mejor, esperando un cambio de su realidad, esclavas luchando por su libertad, esperando un cambio de su realidad, esclavas luchando por su libertad. Invasión que impone fuerza militar, plan de explotación y más desigualdad. Invasión que impone fuerza militar, Plan de explotación y más desigualdad. Supuesto progreso en tecnicolor. Tengamos con sangre y sudor. Supuesto progreso en tecnicolor. Deuda que pagamos con sangre y sudor. Eh, ah, eh. Deuda que no es nuestra, hay que eliminar, con apoyo mutuo y solidaridad. Y ahora la promesa de pobreza y más, cuanto aguanta un pueblo que sucederá. Ahora la promesa de pobreza y más, cuanto aguanta un pueblo que sucederá. Qué lindo, Tini. That's the song um, composed for the scroll, too. They we get to sing together. Um, yes. <laughs> so, Sue, comadre, the question is for you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> can you leave us with, um, with an image um, of a, how a radical future may look like? And again, can be a, a very a close up. It doesn't have to include everything we want, but. Can you give us okay. with an image? <laughs> yeah, but ahora mismo, what I'm thinking is about 
in the future to be alive. Really surviving this moment right now and imagining us, all of us alive together and the end of capitalism and patriarchy also <laughs> coming along <laughs> and uh, also for us to be able to be healthy and free and accountable to each other and just to have access to to a to food and and healthcare and everything that we lack of right now i think it is imaginary future we are still breathing so beautiful thank you um jorge can we ask you the the same question about the scar that your what your picture of the radical imaginary would look like you know we've been uh, a staff you know starting to read and study about abolition and abolitionist practices and um we just had a discussion about um, a, a very specific general very particular article by patrice colors about um about abolition which for i forget the title of it right now um and it's in the harvard review or something like that right um sorry if i'm mistaken but it, it comes up real quick if you look for it but it's like really a general exposition of of what abolition is you know and um and she uses particular experiences in her lives in her life to talk about this and how she could have done better and how abolitionist practices could have defined the way we dealt with our human relationships um with our personal relationships with with our you know relationships with our couples and um and it's been very very really revealing uh for me you know that that that, that this idea of abolition that you know that that we can practically a lot of times don't even consider to envision that really is at the key of all this is the key to transform us is a key for me and trying to really ad adopt radical feminist practices is and, and, and it's a key for the future so i would say that uh this project uh, fortunately for us that we have that is that's about the last day of the last prison really has made this shift of mind about that what does that look like because that's what we believe in we believe in in, 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 a, in a radically different future that we're talking about transformational justice that we're not talking about this culture, terrible culture that we have, you know, in Puerto Rico, if you're on the streets, they arrest you, you know, uh, you know, it should be about public health, but about criminalizing folks, you know, and the folks in, in, in different prisons and then in, in jails that, are, that, that can't get out, that are going to get infected, that are going to have no, 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 no choice. And unless we fight for them, and unless they actually get free. So for me, um, it's been a great moment to look at our personal practices, to look at how I, I also could be better, do better and, as, and, and adopt abolitionist practices. So for me, I'm really excited about an abolitionist future, uh, which coincides with my socialist views. It coincides with the, with, the, with the views that we have of transforming this this economy and society, and to get rid of patriarchy and to get rid of homophobia and transphobia and and racism and all the things that that, that get in the way from our our liberation as a people. Gracias, Jorge. Um, Thank you, um, Gratitud, uh, for sharing this virtual space with us. I wish we could all see everyone's faces. Um, thank you for being in solidarity. Um, we hope you will join us next Wednesday. We'll have same time, same place um, via Zoom, YouTube, or Facebook Live, or afterwards, because we'll be recording. Uh, in the meantime, um, let's look after each other. Let's remember what our humanity, um, what keeps us together, um, and and stay safe, stay the fuck home, and stay healthy. <laughs> gracias, gracias. Cuando luchamos, ganamos. Cuando luchamos, ganamos. So uh, we're going to be doing this every week. Um, I'm going to for the next four weeks and doing a live show and we'll have our technology down by next week. So we'll uh, start and end up closer to time. And the um, uh, we're going to be launching uh, our pre-recorded podcast on uh, Wednesday, April 8th. And I just wanted to let everybody know I see you in the participant list. I've been seeing friends and family and cousins and so many beautiful people out there. And uh, if you're wondering about how to get more involved and join the fight, please visit us at whenwefightwewinnets.com. Uh, this episode was produced by an amazing team that's been collaborating for about a year now 
across many continents. Osvaldo Boudet is our producer. Yuri Lasordo is our managing producer. Our artwork, our incredible, I don't know how you pulled that one off uh, for this show, uh, Jose Hernandez Diaz, uh, otherwise known as our primo, and, uh, and the music by Agustin Munoz Rios, uh, who I've gotten to hear so many years. Uh, podcast music that you'll hear uh, coming up soon is by Reverend Seku. Our social media is coordinated by Talia Carol Cachemuel. And uh, I was wearing a sweater from her hometown earlier in uh, Ecuador. And we want to thank our friends at the New Press Publisher, When We Fight, We Win. It's available on our website and where our books are sold. And uh, it's just so inspirational to come together with all of you and work together and collaborate with this team uh, for a more beautiful, more whole planet. And uh, we're glad to offer this show as a gift to you all and to, uh, to you, our audience, and uh, so glad to be able to do it with Sue and Tini in Puerto Rico, a Casa de Air. Eso. Besos a todo el mundo. Los amamos, de verdad. Les amamos mucho. Thank you so much. This is when I get to use my puppeteer's voice, like what you heard. Please share, subscribe, and follow us on social <laughs> media. <laughs> when we fight, we win on Facebook and Instagram. When we fight, we win on Twitter. And if you have something on your mind, email us at podcast at we win, we fight, we win.com. <laughs> <laughs>